way it's moved. But it's gone now. We don't have to talk about it. We acknowledge that we worship and live on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Atawandere, and the Wega people. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaty. Let us worship together.
vacation Sunday. We gather together this morning and we light this Christ candle as a reminder that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And a sense of calm. 
resurrection in his presence with us this morning. And the way the disciples react is our call to be at peace. Let us pray as the Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
believe that it's big enough for you, please give us feedback so that we can adjust and make it better. Um, if there are problems we want to know, because I can fix stuff, we can work. If there's a glare or anything like that, if the text isn't big enough, please let us know and we'll play around with it. But it was a beautiful thing to watch, all the hustle and bustle in the congregation and the sanctuary this week um, with the installation of that. And Kevin was here working with his team diligently and all the property committee was here helping put the screens up. So we give them a huge, huge thank you because that was a lot of work. And everybody who contributed to that project, thank you. Let us for faith, profess our faith as we sign in the new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We live in God, who has created and is created.
and by God's Spirit, we learn, live, and celebrate as followers of Jesus Christ, reaching out to help our worldwide community, sharing God's love and hope. Amen. them. Yeah. 
one and the same word. So that idea of life, of spirit, of the stuff that makes us, right? When God, in one creation story, forms us out of the clay as creatures, he breathes into them life. It is the breath of life. Without breath, but we don't last very long. Jesus breathes on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. But doubting mightily. What is it about Thomas? He gets a bad rap, right? He's the doubter, the doubting Thomas. It's, it's considered this, it comes with a negative con- connotation, right? He's the kind of odd one out. It's like all the other disciples believed Thomas. But they didn't. And what's really fascinating about this story is that the story last week, Mary Magdalene, who received the news, who meets Jesus first in resurrection, runs back to the disciples, a woman on her own, where you used to need two people to corroborate a story, a single woman, and you needed two men to corroborate a story, not a woman, single woman runs back to this room full of men and says, guys, Jesus is not in the tomb, where did he go? And then afterwards, I met him, he came and he spoke to me, and he said this, he's resurrected. And in her excitement, and probably hysterical spewing out of this story, I mean, imagine how fast you would be talking if Jesus presented himself to you in the flesh after being crucified. And they're like, okay, Mary, bull roar. <laughs> and it was interesting, Todd Thomas was talking about this on the weekend at the Revitalized Conference. We were there and gave a phenomenal lecture, but he used the nastier word. But this is the literal translation of that word. They met her and they did not believe. They doubted, all of them. And they had to go with her. And then when he appeared to the disciples in the room, again, they doubt. They don't recognize Jesus in the flesh. Man, that's crazy. Like, think of how crazy that would be. Somebody who was dead is back to life. Like even to us now, that, that's not something that happens. Right? What unfathomable thing is happening in Jesus' resurrection? So Thomas is not that crazy and he's not unlike the other disciples. So when the other disciples, he, he missed out on the party. Like think of how he feels too. Like man, like why did I choose to go to the bathroom? It's like in the middle of a movie, right? When you go and you leave and you come back and you have no idea what's going on. You pick the worst time to walk out of the room. You miss the plot. Something has happened that's vital and you're not in on it. So Thomas is not out of the ordinary from the other disciples. He's the same as everybody else. Yeah, right. Jesus, there's no way. Actually, that's crazy. I don't believe you. You're pulling my leg. Until I can touch it and see him and know it's Jesus, I don't believe you. And so Jesus, in his graceful way, comes again and says, Thomas, here, look and touch and see and believe and understand. He's giving him something fathomable that was granted to the other disciples before it was granted to Thomas. And it's not a bad thing to be a little doubtful. We can doubt mightily. And the history of growing Christianity, growing into the majority. So we have to understand our roots come from these, these 12 gathered in a room. The early church was little house churches, pockets of friends. Paul's church in Corinth wasn't more than 30 people, maybe 50 at the most. <coughs> these tiny little pockets of growing Christians, persecuted Christians, people who died in proclamation of their faith. And as we witness that around the world, people being persecuted for being Jewish or Muslim or Christian, and we take it out on each other in these violent acts, how do we hold on to the importance and recognize our privilege in worshiping together so freely, and yet our origins are the same? Our origins are those little churches where people were killed because of their faith in Christ. So we can understand better the reason why the disciples would lock all the doors and shut themselves in to keep people out. We come 
from the poor and the repressed, and to come from those who had to fight and guard and defend their beliefs, risking everything to proclaim their faith. And now today, we've gone through this huge flux where we are a dominant and powerful religion, and as we start to move some of that power, and people in North America talk about, well, Christendom is dying and it will go extinct. It's not true. Christendom is moving, Christianity is moving to fill in those places where people identify with that early church. People identify with the poor and the persecuted. People identify with the lost and lonely and what it is like to proclaim faith at the risk of your life. Christendom moves south into the developing world. The fastest growing rates of religion around the world are in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. People are looking for hope and the good news. And people in North America, we become a little more relaxed, a little more privileged, or a lot more privileged. We settle into an ease, and we lose touch with the meaning and the importance of our roots. We've gained power that moves us in a different direction. We go from the minority to the majority, but how in our power that we have been granted, that we have been privileged, do we go from outcast to popular, or slave to leader, nerd to bully? And it's a reminder that we need to step back and gain some perspective. Does our doubt lead us to progress, or does our doubt hold us in tension from recognizing Christ? Do we fear? Does doubt lead us to fear? We doubt if it will work. We doubt if it's the right move. And what is lost in that doubt? Anything, something, or everything? We, we can be paralyzed in our doubt. And if we don't put our faith forward, we lose out on so much that can be granted by taking that leap of faith. So what does the church look like as a result? Is it a beautiful sanctuary? And how do we define that in itself? Every sanctuary, like every congregation, is different in its beauty around the world. We meet outside, inside, in a small church, in a giant cathedral, with marble floors, with carpet floors, with wood floors, with wood beams, or a shack. Or a field, in the middle of a field, there's an old wooden structure that's more like a barn than a church. The roads don't get plowed in winter, so nobody can get to the church. They just close. All of those things where people pursue their faith without doubt, without trepidation, without any of the stuff that hinders some of those things. So we have these two sides of doubt, the good and the bad. And we in North America are called back in some way to recognize what it's like in the early church. Small groups that gathered and broke bread who met in a house that served and loved one another with passion and with grace. They give and they give until the giving feels like receiving. And Rob Pennell this weekend said something really interesting. He said, the church does not have a mission. The mission has a church. And here we are in this time of doubt of what comes next, of what's the future of Christ, where are you in our society? Where are you in the world in North America? We see people leaving, we see, or we fail to see people coming in. And yet, our mission outlives the whole thing. So how do we drown in that doubt? And what can we do to overcome it? How can doubt also be the thing that saves us? We talked about the early reaction of Mary meeting the disciples. Yeah, right, Mary. There's no way. Bold. 
doubt, seeking understanding, wanting to know more, questioning what we don't know, and trying to pursue something to comprehend. And if we don't question or pursue or ask to know why, doesn't our pursuit show our investment, our love, and our interest? We call our kids to see what they're up to, how their day went. We ask about things. We inquire. We want to know how people are feeling because it's a demonstration of our love and commitment in our relationship. And if that stops, we suddenly feel isolated and segregated and there's something wrong in that relationship. So we seek God out to enter in. It is that relationship that calling. And the whole point is that we don't know, that we can never know. It calls us out to embrace the mystery. The mystery that is beautiful. The mystery that intrigues us. We can never know in life, and that is okay. It's that doubt that keeps our pursuit and our curiosity alive. Our pursuit of life, of love, of the divine. So when you doubt, we have to stop and look around. We have to seek understanding. We have to stop and experience Jesus in relationship. And it's the relationship that we are free to choose. It doesn't smack us over the head and say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, like the resurrection, because we go, holy crow, I can't, it's too overwhelming. We have to stop and look and seek relationship ourselves. We don't get to ring up Jesus on the phone. We have to notice him in relationship. Or simply to pause and look around and pay attention. To notice what happens. To see the interactions between people. To watch in line at the grocery store. Or to see the mother and the baby in front of you. How do they play? How are they making and smiling at each other? How is mom frustrated because baby's been crying a whole grocery trip? And what can we do? What is Jesus calling us to do in that moment? See the person behind the counter. See the interactions and love between your neighbors and between children playing on the road. Take notice of the beautiful and special moments in life that transcend the describable. A hug, a handshake, a kind word, snuggles from children that are without a price tag. The phone calls that out of the blue that make your day or your week. The people enjoying the weather and the sun and walking their dog. That is the stuff where Jesus calls us to notice. Jesus lives in those moments that is the spirit active to notice. And the more you notice, the more the Spirit calls us to work. And we give and we give until the giving feels like receiving. And we receive that overwhelming thing that we can't buy, that we don't really know and that is not tangible, that can be so overwhelming in the moment that we want to doubt whether it is real or fake. But it is the hand of God in the Word made flesh that reaches out and invites us to join into relationship. It's ready for us to take it and join in, but that has to happen, this relationship, our participation, we have to do before we can receive. We have to make a choice to participate. Touch my wounds, says Jesus. Thomas, here I am. Peace be with you. Touch and see and participate because I am and I am here. Amen. Let's join together and see. Come, O Fount of Every Blessing, number 559, in Voice of the United.
do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us, loving us beyond all telling of it. Thanks be to God. <laughs> 